Welcome, dear listener, to the Fred Felton Show. We've had some interesting guests on the show so far, and this time we have Sarah Britton. Some of you will know her on Twitter as Anna Tynes. She's a communication strategist, thought leader, blogger, and painter. So, Sarah, welcome to the show. It's great to be here, Fred. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, it's my pleasure. Okay, so what we do in the beginning is we just go through some of the highlights or low lights that have been going on in social media. I'm going to ask your opinion on some of them. Um, what do you make of social media history being made by a man proposing to his girlfriend, uh, Marsha Collier, using Vine? I think it's pretty much inevitable. Somebody was going to so- do it sooner, probably, rather than later. So it, it, it doesn't surprise me. I think there are a lot of people out there looking for other ways to make social media history and generate a lot of publicity around it. Okay. Um, Kat Bearding, are you a fan? And have you done it? Uh, can you repeat that? Kat Bearding. Kat a- Bearding. Yes. I am so tempted and I'm also terrified because I, I don't know if my cats would tolerate that. Okay. I've got one... Um, I've got one very, very cooperative ginger Siamese, but, but that would make me a ginger. So I don't know if I can do a ginger cat beard, <laughs> but I'll try, you know, <laughs> now that you put the challenge out there. Okay, I, I look forward to that. Come on, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to try it now. Okay. Um, what do you make of the instantaneous news we now have, like with the awful violence in England? Uh, where a video pops up just after the violence. Have we become so desensitized to violence now, do you think? I don't think we've become desensitized as much as even more addicted to novelty. So whenever I see case studies of uh, social media crises, I, I often have to rack my brains to remember them. And one of the challenges it's both an upside and a downside of social media today is that we have very short attention spans. We expect there to be a new and interesting story all the time. So we we forget quite quickly. So we're horrified for about five minutes and and then we move on to the next story, the next distraction. So, Uh you know, Oscar Pistorius distracted us for for quite a few weeks because that was the, the story gift that kept on giving. But I think already now that they were back in court again. It, it was tiresome. And unless there's new information, we, we're going to lose interest. Mm. And that's the challenge for anybody who wants to keep the attention of this audience. You've got to keep coming up with new stuff. That's not easy. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, switching a bit to advertising. What's the best ad you've seen recently on TV? Best ad I've seen recently on TV. My goodness. That's actually a hard one to remember. I, I, don't watch a lot of TV, and I'm I'm a classic example of somebody who works in advertising, but doesn't doesn't necessarily watch or listen to many of the cha- channels where um, advertising appears. And in fact, my ironically, my current interest is, is less in TV advertising and more in print, okay. purely because the Times newspaper came up with a concept to uh, distract or attract the attention of people like me. And they're incentivizing ad agencies to come up with ads in response to the news, like your your classic Nando's tactical ad. Okay. But to come up with ad ideas, submit them to the editor, and then they'll run the next day a full page, full color ad, which is worth quite a lot of money. So currently, all I'm doing is looking obsessively through the paper, through through an actual paper, paging through these stories that I'd normally only read online, looking for ideas for clients. And we've already submitted a couple uh, for one of the brands that um, I, I work with or or, or on at today, and I'm hoping it'll appear tomorrow. And I thought that was quite an interesting insight. That's how you attract the attention of somebody like me who's completely moved away from traditional media uh-huh. and lives virtually only online. I wow. hardly ever watch TV, hardly listen to the radio, hardly read a magazine. I'm a tough one. Hmm. Oh, okay. Um, you're a communication strategist. Um, why don't you tell us a bit, for people who don't have any idea what that is, what exactly do you do? Well, I, I'm, I'm involved in advertising, and I'm there at the beginning of the process. 
So what will normally happen is a client will call me in and tell them what they need, tell me what they need. So they'll, they'll give me a brief. Do they need to launch a new product? Do they need to market an event? Do they need a social media strategy? Do they need to talk to influencers? So I will tell them what I think they should do. So I come in at the very beginning of the process. I look at the business challenge or the communication challenge. And then I assess what the core message should be, what the creative platform should be. I will then go off and brief the creative team that will come up with the concept for this. And I'll keep tracking it as it goes on and make sure that it aligns with the strategy that was agreed on with the client. So it's making sure it's not always a, a knee jerk uh, communication exercise, that there is, actually is some thought behind it. Because strategy is about anticipating what's going to happen next and making sure that the moves you make align with that and for the best possible outcome for your client. Mm -hmm. So I guess that in a nutshell is what I do. I, I come up with the way we communicate and then somebody else execute that, executes that. So every single ad campaign you see out there, whether it's online or, or TV, will have had a strategy behind it. Mm. There are very few big spenders in advertising who do not employ strategists. Uh -huh. Okay, that's great. Um, you're also a blogger. Tell us a bit about your blog and, and how did you get involved with Mail and Guardian Thought Leader? The Mail and Guardian started years ago. It started in 2008. And in fact, before the Mail and Guardian, I blogged for The Times. When, when The Times launched, blogging was part of its offering. And I was one of the very first bloggers with them. I was one of their most popular bloggers. I picked up a really nasty stalker which um, who started parodying my blog. And eventually I decided to, to walk away from it. So it was getting too scary. Wow. And, and then I moved to Australia and I decided to document my, my move to Australia for the Mail and Guardian because it is such a contentious issue. Mm. So that's when I proposed, I, I approached them and said, would they like me to blog for them? And they said, sure. And so I've been blogging on and off for Thought Leader since 2008. I don't blog for them as regularly as I used to because to find the time um, is a challenge. And also I think bloggers face the, this challenge with the comments facility with, with mm. certain audiences. There is a lot of cyberbullying. There's a lot of trolling. Yeah. And a lot of us don't actually read the comments because it's it's too hard. Mm. I was chatting to another thought leader blogger the other day, and she mm. confessed that she doesn't read a lot of the comments either. And it's, I, I think it becomes incredibly distracting. That's one of the biggest challenges of blogging is the audience. And that's a challenge for anybody who puts anything out there now. It is so easy to be nasty, to be critical, to shoot things down. And people, when they're hiding behind their screens and typing stuff in and being anonymous, mm. yeah, they, they say things that they would never say to somebody's face. And, and that irritates me. Yeah. Okay. Um, a bit scary that, but anyway, give us some tips for people who want to start blogging. Okay. Well, bl blog about stuff that 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 isn't controversial. Um, you probably do have you have to set up some sort of comments filtering facility. I find on my personal blogs where I don't drive a lot of traffic, where I, I just it's it's just a platform for me to post something if I feel like it, then I don't get too much abuse. But on when you're writing for a major blogging platform, any of the News 24 platforms or for Thought Leader, where, where the standard of comments is much higher and they do filter. So I, I, I hate to think what doesn't get through, but it, it, it's a real challenge. And, and I think it puts a lot of people off blogging, mm. the, the scariness of having to put yourself out there and, and getting so much abuse.